Turning to tonight and uh, to our speaker who's going to be talking to us tonight, it is, of course, the very wonderful Chris Mitchell. Chris has a PhD from the University of Leicester on the topic of medieval astrology and an MA in cultural astronomy and astrology from Bath Spa University College. He's a tutor on that MA course now, um, hosted at the University of Wales um, in this day and age, and he holds a diploma in medieval astrology from Astrologos. He has been actively involved in promoting and teaching astrology since the 1990s and is on the boards of the Astrological Association and the Association of Professional Astrologers International. That's the APAI. And he's given talks to groups and conferences in Europe and the US. And so I, I know that Chris is, is known internationally, but I would just like to reiterate that he is very special to us here in the United Kingdom. I've, I've listed in, in a rather academic fashion all the things that he's involved in. Chris is deeply involved in protecting astrology, doing the best that can be done for astrology and curating it and helping moving it um, into the 21st century. Um, we're very, very lucky to have him as a friend of Aquarius 7, and we really appreciate that he comes to talk to us. He is a treasure and we do treasure him. He is the author of England's first astrology book, and we're putting a link um, if you're interested in looking at that book and perhaps buying it. We're also putting a link to that in our chat box. And he was the joint recipient of the Charles Harvey Award for Exceptional Service to Astrology, as I've just said, in 2021. But now that's enough of all the introductions. I would like now to hand over to Chris and uh, his talk tonight, which is, going, is entitled The William Lilly Soap Opera. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Pamela. And before I share my screen, I just want to say it's always a fantastic honour to talk to Aquarius 7 because I lived in Bristol for 30 years and was doing astrology and it was like it felt like a little island. And I met somebody who said, oh, I've got a friend called Graham who runs an astrology group in Cheltenham. And that was in the 90s. And it was like, oh, my God, there are other people doing this. And it's Aquarius 7 that got me started on my astrological journey. So I've got a huge amount to be thankful to Aquarius 7 for. It really is my astrological spiritual home. And I'm always absolutely delighted to give talks here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and also, I'd just like to say that so many local groups now are online. And that is also thanks to Aquarius 7 and to the um, incredibly generous support that uh, Graham gave to local groups uh, back in the day when COVID hit and all local groups thought we might as well shut up shop. And it was like, no, no, you don't have to do that. And as a result of that, the local astrology groups are thriving all over England and Wales now, um, which is, uh, uh, well, and in, sorry, England, Wales and, and, and Scotland. So it's absolutely brilliant. So yeah, it's always absolutely lovely to speak to this group. So thank you. So I'm going to kick off by just sharing my screen and Hopefully uh, you can, well, in a second, you'll all be able to see the opening slide because we're going to be looking at William Lilly and his contribution to um, uh, to astrology. But I want to kick off by seeing what most astrologers actually know about him already. So, I mean, feel free to uh, unmute or post in chat and just answer this. Who, who was William Lilly and what was he famous for? I'm just interested to see what sort of answers people come up with on that. And what's the first sort of thing that about? comes to mind is the Civil War. That sort of places him. Mm. But what's he famous for and what sort of astrology? Mundane. Mundane. Good answer. He used to just read. Didn't he just read hundreds and hundreds of charts of people who turned up at his doorstep? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, he, yeah. He just would sit in his kitchen and people would just turn up with question after question after question. Horrory, of course. Would <laughs> horrory, just, yeah. Yeah, horrory. And horrory is what most people say. I mean, because this is Aquarius 7, I'm getting lots more answers that are actually far more accurate because most people say, yeah, he was a horrory astrologer, wasn't he? And most astrologers in the UK will definitely be aware that he was an astrologer a few centuries ago and that he was famous for a horrory astrology book called Christian Astrology. And horary astrology is where instead of casting a birth chart, cut somebody comes along and asks a question, like, you know, where is my missing sheep or my lost wedding ring or something like that? And the astrologer casts the chart for the time that the question was asked and provides an answer. 
Um, now, in this talk, I want to show that there's a lot more to William Lilly than just Christian astrology and horary. Uh, Christian astrology is definitely his most famous work, and the full title is Christian Astrology Modestly Treated of in Three Books, which he describes what they are, and we'll have a look at that later. So this talk is modestly treated of in three parts. So we're going to start off by taking a look at the man himself and his early life. Then we'll look at his complex relationship with two other astrologers of the time. That's the soap opera part. And then finally, we're going to look at his contribution to astrology. So it could make a good musical as well as a soap opera, actually. But let us kick off by um, saying a good place to ask about William Lilly the man is to ask Lilly himself. I mean, it's going to give a fairly biased picture, but that's what autobiographies are about. And in the 66th year of his life, so that's when he was 65, uh, Lilly wrote his autobiography for the benefit of his friend Elias Ashmole. Now, Ashmole kept copious diaries of his own life, and Lilly felt it was important to record his own life as well. And if you look for this autobiography online, you'll find a freely available copy, not the original manuscript, but a book published in 1774, which is just over a century later. And that's a transcript of that autobiography. And in fact, when I prepared this talk for the Faculty of Astrological Studies Summer School earlier this year, I'd assumed that this was the earliest edition that you could get today, this one that's on the screen at the moment. But do you know where the Faculty's Summer School is based? I know that some of you do, because some of you are there. And the answer is, it's in Exeter College in Oxford. And I was staying there, and 160 metres from where I was staying in Exeter is the Western Library, which is the manuscript section of the famous Bodleian Library at Oxford University. And literally one hour before my talk, I found this. And you probably can't read that on the screen, so I'll just give you a close-up of it. It's The Life of William Lilly, Student in Astrology, followed by a Latin introduction. This is the original, not the 100-year-later printed copy, uh, with his signature at the bottom. So that was a real serendipitous treat to suddenly find Lilly's own autobiography in his own hand, uh, less than 200 metres from where I was about to give a talk on William Lilly uh, and his life. And the next page, the bit that isn't in Latin, starts with his autobiography in English. And Lily tells us that he was born in Dysworth in Leicestershire. So that's a good place to start when we're looking at the life of Lily. And the cottage in which Lily was um, born and raised still exists. So I'm going to show you a video of it in a minute. It's only a couple of minutes long. And I'm very grateful to Quentin Field Bowden, who's not a historian. He's actually a cycling coach. But his family was involved in restoring the cottage in 1962. And he's given me permission to use this video for the talk. And he's given me a few other tidbits, too, about the cottage. So I've put a plug in for his sites. He didn't ask me to, but I thought it was polite. Uh, it's, it's a couple of minutes long, this video. There's no speech on it. I think I've probably forgot to share sounds, but it doesn't matter because it's a, just a little bit of background uh, music. There's no there's no speech, so it doesn't matter if you can't hear anything. Um, so I'll, but before I show you the video, I'll just show you a photo of the cottage as it looks today. I live in Leicester, which is quite near Dysworth, and I've got a friend who, until very recently, lived in Dysworth and has been in the cottage. Uh, so the name of Lily is certainly known to the current villagers. And the cottage itself does predate Lily, it's mostly 15th century. Some of the beams are even older, going back to the 13th century. But let's have a look at the actual video itself. when it says the cottage was renovated by relatives of mine that's not mine these are uh quentin's relatives but you can see the renovation work going on
That picture in the living room at the top has a bit of a history. We'll touch on that in a second. So it's rather nice to see that in 1962, instead of just um demolishing cottages because they were a bit old somebody was actually did actually love it enough to renovate it um and live in it and as you can see from the newspaper cuttings of the time there was some local interest in it uh obviously they don't call lily an astrologer that would be far too um black magic for 1962 so it was astronomers old home in use at Dysworth. and the first paragraph in there says the famous though some may say infamous astrologer William Lilly, presumably infamous because, well, he did this astrology stuff and that was a bit taboo back then. Anyway, um, I think I mentioned that there was a portrait in the video, um, here's a closer up, closer up picture of it, which has a rather interesting connection that the chap who let me use the video told me about. This portrait uh, that hung in Lilly's cottage, as you can see, and was owned by Quentin's great aunt, is a self-portrait by a Victorian artist called Emma Gagiotti Richards. And it attracted attention because, as shown in this newspaper article, it was quite unusual to find self-portraits of professional female artists in the 19th century. And it was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1851, and Prince Albert liked it so much, he commissioned a replica of it. And here's the replica. You can see this is taken from the website of the Royal Collection. But it's a replica. The original was the one that was in Lily's cottage in 1962. So we still have a bit of history going all the way from Lily right to the current day. So this was Lily's childhood home. He tells us that he was of yeoman stock. And a yeoman is a farmer who owns a small amount of land. And this wasn't the life that Lily dreamed of. He complains that the town is one of great rudeness where nobody was properly educated. Uh, rude doesn't have the con uh, context that it does today of uh, being impolite. It just means uneducated. Apart from Lily's grandfather, Robert, who sent his son um, to Cambridge, that's uh, uh, Lily's father. And the university link was that the village um, originally, uh, originally was inherited by Margaret Beaufort. So that's the, the mother of Henry VII. And she gave the entire village to Christ College in Cambridge. So basically, the whole village of Dysworth was owned by the university in Cambridge. And Lily's ancestors had been quite well off. One of them was Sir Henry Poole, and the family had been well off. But Lily's grandfather and his father frittered away most of their fortune. And so they ended up living in this rented cottage. And Lily's mother wasn't impressed by it. She had bigger dreams for him. Um, she described her husband's backslidings, as Lily called them. So he was sent to Ashby de la Zouche, which is 10 miles away to be taught by a well-regarded scholar called John Brinsley. And he taught Latin and Greek and, in Lily's words, did breed up many scholars uh, for the university. Now, Brinsley was a strict Puritan. He didn't care for the rituals of the Church of England. And this clearly influenced Lily. He said when he was 15, he was troubled by nightmares about damnation and salvation. And when Lily was 17, Brinsley was forbidden from teaching by the bishop's officers and he moved to London. And Lily had to leave school as well because the family had run out of money and they returned home where he lived in much penury for one year and taught school for one quarter of a year. And it really rankled with Lily that he was the best scholar at his school. He was often called on to settle arguments about Latin grammar and so on. But all his classmates went to Cambridge University and only I, poor, poor William Lily, was not so happy. Fortune then frowning upon father's present condition, he not in any capacity to maintain me at the university. So we can see this really frustrated young Lily, who by his own admission couldn't drive the plough or endure any country labour. 
my father oft would say I was good for nothing. And he was forced into a farming community when he obviously wanted to pursue academic pursuits that he was very good at. And Lily then relates how his fortunes changed when his father's attorney, a solicitor, suggested to Lily that he moved to London because the solicitor knew a man there who was looking for a servant. And it wasn't an easy journey for Lily. He left Dysworth. This map shows where Dysworth is. And he went to Leicester first, which, as you can see, is just sort of south of uh, Leicester. I put Ashby on there, which is where he had gone to school. And he went to Leicester to visit his father in jail. And we can see how poor the family was. His father was in jail for debt. And after that, Lily walked to London. It was a five day walk of about 100 miles. And it was during stormy weather. And when he arrived, his new master, a man called Gilbert Wright, was from Market Bosworth. That's where uh, near where Richard III was killed, um, incidentally. And it's also in Leicestershire. So not to say he was a Leicestershire man as well. Treated Lily very well. Wright couldn't actually read or write himself, but he'd made a name for himself as a trader and he was wealthy. And Lily had numerous duties. Some of them were manual, but Lily didn't complain about that. He um, he was reading and writing for his master. He enjoyed it. He liked the food as well. He said, I saw and eat good white bread, contrary to our diet in Leicestershire. Um, and Wright had married a very rich woman called Marjorie, but the husband and wife constantly rowed. Marjorie was very interested in cunning men, that's magicians and people in, in to the occult arts, and visited them regularly. And this is actually what sparked William Lilly's interest in esoteric things. And one of his duties was nursing her when she developed breast cancer. Uh, Lilly had to dress her wounds. And it, oh, it's horrific, really. At one point, he had to cut the cancer out with scissors. I mean, no anaesthetic back then, just ghastly. And she became very fond of Lily before her death. And she gave him five pounds in gold and also told him there was a trunk with a hundred pounds in it and that he could have that as well. It was at a friend's house. But by the time he'd arrived there, a family member had taken it. Now, she died shortly after, and that was four years after Lily's arrival. And Lily tells us that she had under her armhole a small scarlet bag full of many things. And that included various astrological sigils. Now, Marjorie's first husband, many years previously, before he had died, had been plagued with nightmares. And at the time, she went to visit Simon Foreman, who some of you may well have heard of. He was a, uh, an astrologer and medical doctor. And actually, there's a, a computer game that's been released recently based on Simon Foreman's astrology, where you have to win the game by doing various astrological diagnoses. So check that one out. And he he took one of her sigils and framed it and uh, told Marjorie to give it to her husband to wear around his neck. And apparently at that point, the nightmare stopped. And obviously, after her first husband died, Marjorie kept this sigil. And in early 1626, Gilbert married again, and he treated Lily very well, as I said, and he gave him an allowance of £20 a year. It's hard to work out what that means in modern terms. The Bank of England do have an inflation calculator, and they say that's equivalent to about four and a half thousand per annum. And that's not enough to live on today. But bear in mind, a male servant, which is effectively what Lily was at that time, would have earned about five pounds a year. So 20 pounds a year was quite generous, not a ter terrible salary. But things were about to get a lot better. Because about a year later, Gilbert himself died. Um, he'd lived with Lily at the corner house in the Strand in London. Now, this picture shows the approximate location. It's near the old Strand station. And a plaque was put up in 2003 with the help of various astrologers, including Deb Holding. And Lily scrupulously kept only the £20 per annum that he was entitled to. But this was about to change because now Gilbert had died, his wife was courted by various old men and she didn't fancy them. But according to a fellow servant, she did fancy William Lily and the servant encouraged him to propose. He was a bit uh, reluctant, but he eventually did. And she said, no, you're too young. But Lily replied, what I have not in wealth, I would supply in love. And they got married on the 8th of September, 1627. They kept it a secret for two years as they knew the family would be absolutely furious. And having married his former master's wife, Lily now tells us how he came to study astrology. And this was in 1632. So a friend told Lily that he knew a scholar who could make, and I'm quoting from Lily here, an almanac 
which to me was strange. So at this stage, Lily didn't know anything about astrology, but he was intrigued by it. And he was introduced to a Welshman called Evans who lived in Gunpowder Alley. I mean, that's a fabulous name for a street, isn't it? And he was a wise man who studied the black art. And Evans was apparently suffering from a huge hangover when Lily arrived. And Lily writes, he, having been drunk the night before, was upon his bed, if it be lawful to call that a bed, whereupon he then lay. He roused up himself, and after some compliments, he was content to instruct me in astrology. And Lily studied with him for seven or eight weeks. And Lily goes into great detail about his appearance. He says he was the most saturnine person my eyes ever beheld, of a middle stature, broad forehead, beetle brow, thick shoulders, flat nosed, full lips, down looked, black curling stiff hair and splay footed. So he's starting to get this is where you see a lot of these descriptions later on in books like Christian astrology. What does a Saturn person look like? Now, Lily studied astrology obsessively after that. He bought numerous books and he says astrology in this time, namely in 1633, was very rare in London. Few professing it that understood anything thereof. And he then gives a list of astrologers that he don't think who he doesn't think were very good who lived in London. Now, Lily's marriage to this older woman seemed to be a very happy one. Uh, but in October 1633, just as he was getting into astrology seriously, she died. And Lily inherited her fortune, which he said was close to a thousand pounds. Now, that's a huge amount of money. I said he was on a fairly decent salary for a servant earlier on. Well, this is um, 50 times as much as that. So this was a, a vast amount. He was rich now. And he writes, relates the tale of his most munificent patron and ever bountiful friend, William Pennington, who had been a friend of Lily since 1634. And Lily says he did write one treatise about the eclipse of the sun in 1639, which was just six pages long. And he gave that manuscript to Pennington. And Lily speaks very highly of him. And this 1639 text, it doesn't exist anymore, as far as we know. That would have been Lily's first astrological work. We haven't got a copy of it, though. Now, as far as I know, because this work was never published in print, it's not listed as any of Lily's works. And I don't even know if Lily was on the radar in 1639. Probably not. I did find this really interesting early reference to somebody called William Lily in a book of epigrams by Thomas Bancroft. Bancroft had dedicated this work to Sir Charles Shirley, and Epigram 185 is to William Lilly, a grand schoolmaster. Don't know if this is our William Lilly or not, because Lilly had been a teacher, but it was very brief, and as a much younger man in the 1620s, he certainly wasn't the teacher in 1639, and the line uh, in this dedication about twigs of bay that shall stick to his tomb definitely sounds more like an epitaph than uh, an epigram, and Lilly was quite young at this point. But Lily certainly did know of Sir Charles Shirley because he noted when he died uh, some years later. So there might be a connection there, but I don't know. He wrote a Latin note about Shirley. But 1639 was his first work, but it wasn't published. It was just given to a friend. And his first published work, uh, which he describes as his maiden dedication, was actually about a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. It wasn't about horary. And he says in this book, uh, be pleased to receive this, my maiden dedication. And you can see the date at the bottom of that is 16, well, uh, 1644 is when it was actually printed. Um, now, the conjunction that he's talking about is given in the uh, title of it, as you can see, as happening in 1642 stroke three. And if you're wondering why they didn't know what year it was, it's because of a really odd convention when old style dates were used. Um, England didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1752, so a long time after Lily. And the new year before that began on the 25th of March. So the month after December 1642 wasn't January 1643, it was January 1642. Uh, and then it was February 1642, then it was March 1642, but the day after March the 24th, 1642, was the 25th of March, 1643. Bonkers, I know, but that's how it how it was. And to make it clear that January, February and most of March were in this sort of curious limbo state, some authors, particularly Ashmole and quite often Lily, would use this weird notation where they put 1640 
two three meaning it's kind of in this period before the 25th of march when the new year happened some writers at the time would say it was 1642 but lily hedged his bets by saying well it depends which notation you use as i say it is nuts because sometimes lily sets a chart for say february 1646 and we would say actually it's 1647 but his almanacs always start in january and do increment the year then so uh, lily was a little bit slapdash about how he used years but i'm digressing because lily's first published work was about a saturn jupiter conjunction not horror astrology and it was published in 1644 and that was the first of many works published by lily and another one published that year in june 1644 triggered what can only be described as a complete shitstorm. so this is where the soap opera begins so let me now introduce the participants in this fracas. So the dramatis personae are Elias Ashmole, Sir George Wharton and William Lilly. Now, Lilly is often seen as an astrologer who became active during the English Civil War and was on the side of the parliamentarians. And we saw earlier that he'd been taught by Puritans. So you might think, well, that's where his sympathies lie. It's royalists versus uh, roundheads and cavaliers he was on the side of the roundheads the uh, parliamentarians but it was a lot more nuanced than that because lily relates a tale uh, of a person i mentioned earlier his most munificent patron and ever bountiful friend william pennington and he'd been a friend of lily since 1634 and he was the one that lily dedicated his work on the eclipse to and lily tells us in 1639 so this was before the civil war kicked off three years later Pennington was made a captain and served Charles I in his wars against the Scots. Pennington was, in Lily's words, a true royalist. So you might expect him not to get on because we, we see Lily as a parliamentarian. And in fact, Charles II later made Pennington one of his commissioners. Now, at one stage, Pennington was vilified by a parson called Isaac Antrobus, who was, according to Lily, a great champion for Parliament. So we might expect Lily to be on Antrobus's side um rather than pennington's but lily sided with his royalist friend and basically got antrobus the sack so this is where the story of his political loyalties becomes quite interesting because he wrote a work about another conjunction this time it was a jupiter mars one and lily declares that he's not anti-monarchy but he does have sympathy with the cause of parliament and he would like to see a reconciliation between king and parliament so he's hedging his bets a bit at this stage now, Sir George Wharton was a royalist, and he was also an astrologer who published annual almanacs. He didn't seem to be aware of William Lilly until the publication of Lilly's prognostication. And this is uh, an almanac published by Wharton in 1645, and it's a fairly innocent almanac, apart from the very final bit where Wharton has a section on the eclipses of 1645. And he finishes with this little gem. But here I cannot omit the impudent and senseless discourse of William Lilly in a pamphlet of his styled Supernatural Sights and Apparitions, etc., licensed by that licentious libeler John Booker, concerning the eclipse of the sun, which happened on the 22nd of August, 1644. And yet, forsooth, this pseudo-prophet must prefer his own opinion before the judgment of all sound astrologers that ever writ, neither quoting author nor rendering any reason but his own private fancy for what he saith. But of this and the like absurd, uh, absurdities heretofore published by Booker, Lilly and others of their brotherhood, I shall, God willing, take occasion hereafter to write more at large. And so until the next year, farewell. Now, Wharton's arguments is eclipses don't mean anything unless you, they can be seen. And you couldn't see this eclipse in Britain. So it was really stupid for Lilly to even mention it. Well, Lilly wasn't particularly happy by this attack, as you can imagine. And he said he called me an impudent senseless fellow and by name william lilly before that time i was more cavalier than roundhead and so taken notice of uh, but after that i engaged body and soul in the cause of parliament so it just seems really bizarre to our way of thinking that somebody's going to switch sides in a civil war because they got a bad review but that does seem to be what happened in lilly's case now, Wharton was scathing about Lily's eclipse track, uh, tracks, even though Lily's parliamentary sympathies were couched in fairly cautious terms. But Lily also published this very controversial pamphlet in 1644. 
I'm pretty sure Wharton hadn't read this one when he issued his 1645 almanac, because he would have blown a gasket if he had. And it said this prophecy of the White King by William Lilly, it starts off with a statement that Lilly wishes to avoid all misconstruction that my intentions might point to any particular man living, claiming that this book relates to a Welsh legend and not a real king. So the White King in question was certainly Welsh and implied it related to a king who lived centuries earlier. But the true meaning becomes pretty obvious in his preface, entitled to all well-affected Englishmen, where he writes, you see what storms, what miseries, what cruel wars our nation is one like to suffer by the means and procurement of a king called a white king. He brings over strangers to destroy us. And it was pretty clear that, Willie, uh, that Lily was referring to Charles I, who was frequently known as the White King. So this was uh, a fairly uh, controversial thing to say, should we say, and it definitely put him on side of uh, the anti-monarchists at that point. And the war of words continued and Lily published more pamphlets supporting the parliamentary cause. Now, Sir George was not a man to mince his words. He seems to have been a bit of a loudmouth, frankly. And he introduced, uh, issued this furious rebuttal of everything Lily had written with this most scathing preface. And this was in a work written in 1646 and published in 1647. I'm going to read it out in full because it is just such a brilliant tirade. It is a common proverb, dogs bark more for custom than fierceness, and had I not assuredly known this whelp Lily to be one of that bawling litter, I should not have suffered his perpetual snarling with that patience and temper I did, but before this would have alighted from my saddle to hurl him one stone at least to gnaw on. But as he's now grown bolder and blacker in the jaws, I must begin to have an eye over him and a care to keep him at a distance, lest he bite me till I bleed, and thereby I become maniac or brain-sick like himself, and so be more desirous of his liver than his heart. I shall scorn to take notice of his former grinnings, nor will I trouble myself or the reader with any repetition of his bypass fooleries, frantic expressions, and but a few, if any, of his many errors and mistakes so grossly committed in every one of his lousy pamphlets. For them I have tied and twitched up together in a pack thread as thinking them fitter for his quondam hell than the meanest shelf in my study. But I'll content myself only with that dainty bit that this sweet brat of his own begetting, Merlini Anglici Ephemeris, the fourth and perhaps the last of that name, and examine I shall, and that strictly, of what metal it's compounded, and whether it be simple, like the dad of it, Lily, and the truth you have freely as followeth. So we can, I think we can say that Sir George Wharton was not a fan of William Lilly and was uh, not shy about saying so. Now, if you visit Oxford, and it's well worth a visit, and needless to say, I'd particularly encourage you to go to Oxford next year for the faculty summer school in person, I'd urge you to go to the Ashmolean Museum. It's free and it's fascinating. And as you go in, you'll see a large room with some portraits. And here's a picture of that large room. And two of them are significant to our story. Uh, the one highlighted top right is William Lilly. And the large one at the bottom is the founder of the Ashmolean Museum, Elias Ashmole. So let me introduce Elias Ashmole and look at the relationship between these two men. Now, Ashmole was a fellow royalist. He was a good friend of George Wharton. And the publisher isn't listed on the front cover of Wharton's scathing pamphlet, but it was probably Ashmole who was going to publish it. And this is because Ashmole kept copious diaries and they're all um, available. I'm, uh, they're in about, I think, six or seven volumes and fortunately my local university library actually has a copy of all of these um and in his diary for the 19th of november 1646 he says note of an orrery question 230 whether it'll be any prejudice for me to publish wharton's errors against lily so it looks like this scathing attack was probably uh going to be published by ashmole because he was a friend of wharton and here's the chart for the horrory that he cast and remember ashmole said should i publish this what do you reckon let's let's spend a couple of minutes looking at that what do you think of this horror -y? feel free to unmute yourself or type in chat bear in mind if you unmute yourself you might appear on the recording when you speak because your image will pop up any ideas any suggestions In horrory, the person asking the question 
is the ascendant and if he's asking about somebody else uh you know uh, a, a possible enemy is he going to make an enemy of lily that would be the ruler of the seventh house so any any observations on the ruler of the first house which is venus and the ruler of the seventh house which is mars remember there was no pluto in those days mars ruled scorpio anything in the chat well the, the querent is in detriment in scorpio yeah absolutely. in the house of the quesited exactly so ashmole is in detriment and he's in lilius he's in the house of his open enemies what else can we see there it's square to mars yep it's he's... square to mars so that's going to suggest a pretty bad outcome now mars itself that's if you like that's lily so mars and ashmole are at square each other they're at loggerheads mars doesn't really have any dignity but he is conjunct jupiter so he's quite strong so if you were ashmole doing this going i'm in detriment in lily's house at loggerheads with him and he's quite strong because he's next to jupiter would you think it was a good idea to publish having asked the question yourself or would you go i think it's a no from me also the moon is peregrine in the sixth yes sounds pretty no to me <laughs> it sounds pretty no to me as well um now to be fair ashmole only knew of lily by reputation and they hadn't met but they were introduced the following day hit it off immediately and forced a lifelong friendship despite a difference of political opinion because ashmole was a royalist and lily as we saw was anti-royalist but despite the horror not looking very good, it should have been a no. But Ashmole went ahead and published it anyway. And this meant there was a kind of sword of Damocles hanging over Ashmole's head. He obviously hadn't told Lily this. They were uh, they got on so well and he thought, hmm, OK, I've just published this. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll just keep quiet about it. He won't find out. Um, and it seems that Ashmole actually gave further information to Wharton because they were good friends. And that meant that Wharton published even more slurs against Lily. And a year later, Lily discovered Ashmole's treachery and they had a huge falling out. Ashmole, as I say, kept copious diaries and he records in his diary. This morning, Lily told me of my discovering his secrets to Wharton. Oops. Anyway, the falling out didn't last long because there's a magical text called Picatrix, which is um, a fascinating story in its own right. I, I gave a talk to Aquarius 7 some years ago about it, actually. It was a, a text that was pre-Islamic. It was translated into Arabic in the 12th century. Then it was translated into Spanish and Latin in the 13th century. It was a source of fascination to Renaissance magicians and people like John Dee and so on, and also Elias Ashmole and William Lilly. And Ashmole copied, hand copied, a copy of this magical text by hand and presented his copy to Lily. So this was a really special present. I mean, it's a real labour of love. And they were best friends again. And the friendship continued. And in fact, continued right up until the point when Lily died. But despite the furious war of words, and this is where the soap opera really kicks off, fate took a very strange turn. Because it actually turned out to be a really good thing for Wharton, Lily's arch enemy, that Ashmole and Lily made up. Because two months later, uh, the tables are turned by then. Remember, Lily was listened to because he was a royalist, but then he became a parliamentarian, so he was a bit of a renegade then. But by now, Cromwell was in charge, or at least if he wasn't in charge, he was kind of the he was the de facto ruler uh, by this time. And Wharton was arrested because he had published a vicious satire against Parliament. So George Wharton was not a man to um, uh, of great diplomacy. If he was angry about something, he would say so and the consequences be damned. Um, so he published this vicious satire against Parliament and he was imprisoned. And then he escaped from Newgate Jail and he was recaptured a year later. And this time, they decided they were going to hang him. And Ashmole was best friends with George Wharton and he persuaded Lily to intervene. And because Lily was on the parliamentary side, he had a lot of clout with Cromwell. This is another thing that seems weird. Lily was a famous astrologer. We always we all think of the church as being quite anti-astrology and probably the Protestant church more so than the Catholic one. And uh, 
or, or even the Anglican one. And Cromwell was definitely a Protestant, but he was quite happy with, you know, being friends with an astrologer. And he had a lot of clout with Cromwell. Uh, Cromwell was the de facto ruler of England by now. Wharton and Ashmole, of course, are both royalists, so Cromwell didn't like them. But Lily intervened and argued Wharton's case. And it was like, yeah, look, we know he's a bit of a loud mouth, but come on, you don't have to hang in. And Cromwell said, oh, all right, then we'll we'll let him go. And he was quite really quietly released from jail and was then grudgingly supportive of Lily for having saved his life despite having been enemies. So that's the that's the uh, Lily Wharton um, uh, Ashmole soap opera. Now, there is some doubt about Lily's chart. Astro Data Bank will give you a time of 200, 0200 with a Rodden rating of A. But the chart depicted in this slide it's an often used one from John Gadbury's collection of nativities printed in 1662. Now, Gadbury is a bit dubious about um, Lily. He says he hath pretended himself to have two several nativities, one with the moon in Pisces from his 1645 almanac and one with the date of the 1st of May 1602. Gadbury comments that the moon in Pisces chart would make him a piece of a good fellow and so on which, if true, means he must have been born on the 5th or 6th of May, 1602, not the 1st. But apparently, Lily told Ashmole that his ascendant was three degrees of Pisces, 56. Now, in this discussion, I'm going to go with Gabriel's chart. It's got a slightly later time of 0208. Don't be fooled by the fact that it says the date is the 30th of April. Times were a bit weird in the 17th century. So when it gives the time of April the 30th, 14 hours, 8 minutes... Today, we would think that means uh, eight minutes past two in the afternoon. But 14 hours and eight minutes post meridium actually means 14 hours and eight minutes after noon. And if you start at noon and move forwards 14 hours, you get two o'clock in the morning, of course. So this is actually 0208. That's in the morning on the 1st of May. The diagram in Gabri's book uses Regimentana, so I'm going to use that as well. I've had to tweak Gabri's coordinates a bit to get the houses to match, but they're more or less right. And Gabri's position of the sun and moon aren't quite right. The sun's six minutes too far forward. The moon's about a degree too early. But that was kind of the margin of error in the 17th century. So here's um, Lily's chart in a more readable modern format. And we've got Pisces rising. So what do we think? Of, what do we think of this chart? Any comments? That close um, conjunction of Venus Sun must have given him some charm. Yes, he's he's got what looks like a grand trine in Earth. Absolutely, yes, he's got Mars, which um, would be a fantastic gift for him. Yeah, yeah, Mars, Moon, and um, well, that whole little stellium, really. Mercury, uh, the modern, we'd say Uranus, but obviously he didn't know about that, but Mercury, Venus, and Sun. And yeah, he was a yeoman farmer. He didn't want to be, but <laughs> that was his background. It's a bit of a troubled Jupiter uh, because that Jupiter is in, uh, is square to the moon, but that's not too bad. It is retrograde. Mars is right on the angle, uh, right on the descendant there. Um, and yes, it trines Mercury. Um, he's got a retrograde Saturn opposing a very close Sun-Venus conjunction. In fact, Deb Holding would probably, well, would say Venus is Kazemi there. Normally, if the planet's very close to the Sun, we say, well, it's combust, it's burnt out. Um, but there was an exception to that. If a planet was actually within 17 minutes of the Sun, it was said to be Kazemi. But Deb Holding has a theory that actually a lot of authors said oh, if it's in the same degree, it's Kazemi. It doesn't have to be 17 minutes. Jury's out on that one. But yeah, look at all those planets in Earth signs. He's from a farming background, but he's a boy with an academic ambition. And the ruler of the ninth house there, you can see um, Jupiter is in an air sign. And um it's his career too. It's also the ruler of the uh, of the MC. So I know that they didn't know about Uranus back then, mm. but I'd like to point out that Uranus at the beginning of the second house, as part of this sort of grand trine, 
um, which is also Taurus about property, money and everything, would very strongly indicate him making a load of money in a career as an astrologer. Absolutely. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because if you just use the traditional interpretation, then this grand trine with Venus being there in the second house is Venus in the second house. Well, that's Inheritance making money through <laughs> it's making money through marriage yeah. and making money through love. If you use a modern lens, you get the same answer. This is why I'm a great fan of mixing and matching traditional astrology and modern astrology, because astrology is just the universe talking to us. And it uses lots of different languages and you often get the same answer, even if the languages are slightly different. So I just think that is you've just given a, a beautiful example of that, I think. Well, so, also, your in the second shows that sudden windfall he had when he married. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. In fact, John Frawley, who's a horary astrologer who always used to rail against astrologers that dared to use modern planets, gave a talk to the AA a few years ago on using uranus neptune and pluto in horary uh, and i think he's a bit of a convert and he started by saying here's one question by lily uh and he goes right round the houses in order to come up with an answer if only he had upgraded as ephemeris to include uranus he'd have seen it straight away yeah. so <laughs> so that i don't mean this chart this was a a different one that frawley was talking about but um yeah you can't ignore it now, this one's got Gemini rising. Uh, this is Ashmole's chart. And we've got here uh, Mercury in rulership. It's combust, and but it's in rulership. And it's square Mars. Now, Ashmole's Jupiter is an interesting one right on the MC. It's retrograde, but it's not aspecting any of the traditional planets. It is actually trining Neptune. And I think that's actually quite an interesting indicator for somebody who became famous for copying a book on magic. Um, obviously, Lillian Ashmore wouldn't have spotted that because they didn't know about Neptune. Um, but he was prominent. He was um, he was prominent. He was famous. He was rich. He founded the Ashmolean Museum. And we got Jupiter on the midheaven. So quite an interesting chart there. Yeah. Now, this one is uh, a chart of a triwheel of the meeting of Ashmole and Lily. I've set it for 1900. There is some doubt. Ashmole in his diary said it was on a Friday night and I think it was the 20th of November. So there is some doubt here. But this is quite an interesting chart. You can immediately see there's a connection between these two men. Uh, they're 15 years apart in age, but Ashmole's Saturn moon conjunction, as uh, the inner wheel is Lily, and the middle wheel is Ashmole. So his Saturn moon conjunction there is right on Lily's Sun Venus conjunction. And their Marses are conjunct as well. So there's definitely a connection there. They're 15 years apart in age. Um, on the auspicious day that they met, and that must have been a pretty significant day. It was the start of a lifelong friendship. There aren't any transits screaming out here. You could find some, but it's not that dramatic. Uh, there was a very close Sun, Mercury, Neptune conjunction uh, that Jupiter trying closely, and they were both into magic. Uh, but if we produce a composite chart for these two men, and this isn't technique that Lily used, we can see something else. This is a composite chart. And I think this is fascinating because Jupiter, as we saw, is kind of prominent in both men's chart, but it's not in a great condition in either. In Lily's chart, Ret uh, Jupiter's retrograde and squares the moon. In Ashmole chart, he's retrograde and unaspected, although it is right on the midheaven. But look at this composite chart. There's Jupiter in. Um, uh, sorry, where's the? Yeah, sorry, the the the, in, the inner uh, one is the composite. There's Jupiter in Sagittarius, so in rulership. And look at the transits to this composite chart. If we think of this inner wheel as being this kind of lily ash mole combination, look what's happening on the day they met. Look at all of those planets in Sag uh, hitting that Jupiter. Transiting Jupiter's making an exact trine um, to the uh, uh, to the composite Jupiter. That magical Sun Mercury Neptune conjunction is conjuncting it. Uh, transiting Pluto's opposing it. This is pretty powerful stuff. 
this is their composite jupiter and bang they met and here we have this lifelong uh, friendship and working relationship so it was all sweetness and light when they met and that composite jupiter played a big role now let's fast forward a year and this is when they had their big falling out and what an extraordinary set of transits on that day look at that humongous stellium there in sagittarius hitting that jupiter um that sun uranus moon neptune venus mercury mars stellium is hammering down on this composite jupiter ouch and this time transiting jupiter which had been uh, in a nice condition uh, is uh, is now uh, in leo trining it is now in virgo in detriment squaring this huge so instead of making a nice try and it's now squaring this enormous stellium and it's slap bang on the composite mars so no wonder there was a falling out i mean that just tells the story doesn't it and this is when ashmole records in his diary this morning lily told me of my discovering his secrets to wharton i set this chart for noon two months later a contrite ashmole presents his handwritten copy of picatrix to lily very special gift as i said and just using traditional planets there's nothing jaw-dropping about this chart but perhaps you can see something if you do include the modern planets look at that uranus absolutely within minutes slap bang on jupiter a sudden change of fortune uranus comes along and bang it's all sweetness and light again ashmole doesn't make a big song and dance about it he just said this evening i delivered to mr lily picatrix and was reconciled to him so they're besties again and that's pretty much the end of the soap opera side of it so now i'll just uh round off the final part by saying we've seen that lily's initial publications were on mundane astrology eclipses and their effects uh, jupiter saturn conjunction and this controversial pamphlet attacking charles the first but this is the work that he's most famous for christian astrology published in 1647 and if you say to people what's christian astrology about most people uh and until i read it i thought it was as well assume it's a horary textbook and that's partially true but you can see he says it's three books and the first book he tells us is a way of is basically an introduction to astrology how do you use an ephemeris how do you draw up a chart and so on the second is about horary and the third is a whole bunch of other techniques so the first book is an introduction to astrology in general um and the third is about nativities rectification directions perfection solar returns transits and an example nativity it's a pretty huge book um and it really is uh, a book that somebody that knows nothing about astrology can pick up and work their way through it's not an easy read but you don't need he doesn't assume that you know anything at all about astrology and in fact if we look at the, the breakup of it yes the biggest section is horary but there's a huge prefix and index uh, but horary is the bulk of it but there's a fair amount of other stuff in there as well it covers a lot more and it was a seminal work because it's a textbook that covers everything from the basic principles what are the planets what do they mean what are the signs what are the meanings of the houses right through to the most complex techniques and he starts off with the basics in his first book and there were other textbooks of astrology around at the time but they had been written a long time earlier one popular one was guido bernati's book of astronomy uh it's been it was translated into english about a decade ago maybe 15 years ago now uh but that was already 300 years old and um, one point to mention as an aside is the thorny issue of chart calculation because in the medieval period there weren't any ephemerides as we know them the medieval of the uh, model of the cosmos had the earth at the center and it had planets and the sun all orbiting the earth in circular orbits so this is what the medieval model looked like but and this was around from the time of ptolemy now that model doesn't explain why planets go retrograde or why even the moon which really does orbit the earth and doesn't go retrograde goes at different speeds and ptolemy gets around this problem by saying well actually the planets don't orbit the earth directly they orbit an imaginary point near the earth and that orbit is called the deferent and in addition the thing orbiting the earth on the deferent with things that do go retrograde like 
Mars, for example, uh, isn't the actual Mars. It's a kind of a point that a yellow, that yellow thing there is what we call the mean Mars. And that's the thing that orbits the deference. The real one goes round in a, in a circle in the opposite direction around the mean Mars. It's a bit like those spirograph images that you did as um, as kids. Um, and the, the model works mathematically. It does explain planets going retrograde. It gives reasonably accurate results. But using this model, it's actually really hard to work out planetary positions. There weren't any ephemerides as we know them. Uh, if you think about the American ephemeris for the 20th century or 21st century that we all know and love, it's got two months per page. That's 600 pages in total, and it's fine print. Each date's got 12 values just for planetary positions. Uh, and that's forgetting all the eclipses, aspects, and so on. So you've got 36,525 days multiplied by 12. That's nearly half a million printed values. And medieval manuscripts, here's an, an actual example of a medieval manuscript, <coughs> had to be copied by hand. Um, and you couldn't do that. It simply wouldn't have been practical. So a hundred year ephemeris like the ones that we're used to would have been prohibitive and physically impossible. So instead, you had a shorter set of tables like this that gave planetary uh, positions with instructions on how to calculate them. I say shorter, but there were still five columns and 180 entries. So even that had thousands of values that had to be copied by hand. Chart calculation in the medieval period, a couple of hundred years before Lily, was really, really difficult. And Kepler was the one who cracked the problem. This is a highly exaggerated diagram, but he realized, well, he wasn't the first person. Copernicus knew that the sun was the center of the system. Kepler adopted the model and the Earth and Mars and all the other planets all revolve around the sun. And what Kepler's innovation was, were the orbits aren't perfect circles, they're ellipses. So this highly exaggerated diagram illustrates it. The orbits are elliptical, and that's why planets sometimes seem to go faster and sometimes slower. And Kepler was actually an older contemporary of Lilly. Lilly actually cites Kepler in his catalogue. And interestingly enough, Kepler wasn't really a great fan of traditional astrology. He wanted to reform astrology. He introduced the sesquiquadrate, the semi-square. He introduced the quintile. And Lilly raves about this. He says it's really important to use the new aspects, by which he means the ones that we use today, and including the quintile, which I think is probably not as widely used. Lilly even has a lovely little symbol for a quintile, which is a heart. So I think we should go back to using that glyph again. That's the, I think that's rather lovely. Um, but Lilly had two huge advantages when writing his textbook that medieval writers didn't have. Firstly, there was a printing press. And secondly, Kepler's model made for more accurate tables. And Lilly actually had an ephemeris in the form that we know and love today. And Lilly cites Kepler's ephemeris in his bibliography. So we know he was using it. So here's an actual photograph of William Lilly sitting in front of his laptop calculating a chart. But Actually, if you think about it, who remembers using tables of houses and an ephemeris to draw up charts? I think a lot of us do here. These days, of course, you don't, none of us use an, well, I'm sure some people do. Most of us don't use an ephemeris anymore. We just use our astrology program. But the way we did it right up until very recently and the way some people still do it today is actually very similar to the way that Lily did it. For, 400, for nearly 400 years, that's how we did charts, right up until the 1990s. And in fact, when I started doing astrology in the 90s, I came across astrologers who were either a bit allergic to arithmetic and maths, or they had so many clients they couldn't waste hours in the effort of chart calculation and drawing up a chart. So they'd actually send birth data off to a professional company who would do the calculations and physically post a chart back. So that was a service that was available in the 80s and 90s. But then a quantum leap happened. By the early 1990s, when many of us could actually afford to buy a personal computer, it revolutionized the way that we do astrology. So you could draw up a chart in seconds now. And that means when you're giving a talk or trying something out, you can use dozens of different charts. If you were giving this talk 40 years ago and you had to draw up all these charts by hand, it would be quite a long process. And um, when I gave this talk in the summer, I suggested that prior to Kepler, astrologers had to do these really horrific calculations, but that Lilly had the luxury of a newfangled ephemeris that had only been available for a couple of decades. So he would have been aware of a similar quantum leap. 
somebody questioned that and after the talk and I researched it a bit more and it turns out to be a lot more nuanced than that because actually the 15th century astrologer Richard uh, Trevithian writing 200 years before Lily <coughs> because uh, printing hadn't been hadn't arrived in Europe yet did do his, his own calculations according to the historian Sophie Page um, but Philip Notthaft has recently published an article reviewing medieval ephemerides and it does appear that just like those professional chart calculation companies of 30 years ago, some astrologers who were adept at doing horrific medieval chart calculations did produce handwritten ephemerides for, say, a 20 year period with 10 day intervals, which kind of is good enough to do the job. And they were shared amongst other astrologers. And that did dramatically simplify it. So these would have been quite expensive because they were handwritten. But by the time the printing press came along, well, really, that was the quantum leap. Because back in 1474, when Johannes Regimentanus published the 900 page ephemeris listing daily uh, positions of planets, that was printed. It was affordable. It could be mass produced. So actually, astrologers were using ephemerides a long time before Lily, but they got more accurate when Kepler produced his. <coughs> so we do have evidence that Lily was using Kepler's ephemeris because he lists it in his bibliography, and that would have been new. And for any enough, uh, anybody geeky enough to be interested in the history of ephemerides, there's a link to Not Half's article here. Uh, you can look at that on the recording later. And this article, pretty unusually for an academic article, is open access, so you don't even have to pay to read it. But here is Lily's major contribution. Christian astrology ends with a catalogue that gives... Uh, <coughs> Uh, gives us of uh, uh, he, he he lists most of the astrological authors whose works are available. Here's a list of just some of them. You might have noticed something about this list on this slide, and that's that the vast majority are in Latin. And even the three that I've highlighted in red, who are English authors: Thomas Allen, Elizabeth the First Magician, and astrologer John Dee, and Robert Flood. They're all English. Most of them are books that aren't contemporary with Lily. Lily is just giving us a list of reprints of very old texts in most cases. But even the ones on this list who were alive when Lily was born, John Dee, just about, Robert Flood, Thomas Allen, Johannes Kepler, they wrote in Latin. So this was a big difference because Lily recognises this is unusual. He makes a point on the last page of Christian astrology that some may blame me that I write in the English tongue. And even Lily can't resist signing off in Latin. But what Lilly did was unusual. He did two things. He wrote a textbook on astrology covering everything from the basic principles to the most complex techniques, and he wrote it in English. Now, Lilly himself was a learned man. He was fluent in Latin, but he knew that writing in English made his work more accessible. And not everybody in interested in astrology was going to be from a well-off family going to university. He knew that from his own personal experience. So what he did was make astrology available to anybody who wanted to learn it in a language that they could understand. And that is quite the contribution. Chris, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much.